Our hosts, the 227 million people who share the world's second largest river, are custodians of 268 million hectares of forest, which constitute 70% of Africa's forest cover and hosts 10% of the world's biodiversity. These nations and peoples are already making a major contribution to the vitality of our planet and the well-being of humanity. The 1.3 billion indigenous people from the three river basins, majority of whom are young, live in intimate proximity with 26% of the world's biodiversity and 1.4 billion hectares of forest and three of the world's greatest rivers and river systems. These unique ecosystems are also our planet's lungs, which capture 1.2 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year, saving lives on Earth from catastrophic global warming and the buildup of greenhouse gas emissions. I recognize the place, role, power, and potential of the three basin biodiversity ecosystems and tropical forests in defining the future of local, regional, and global efforts to manage the triple planetary crisis that confront humanity. They also have the potential to set humanity upon a new path of economic transformation through ecologically responsible production and consumption. Although this role has always been prominent, never has it been as clear and urgent as it is today. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has documented in its most recent consecutive reports that unless we take aggressive measures to protect our forests, the world will not be able to actualize the 1.5 degree centigrade target as agreed in Paris Summit, even if other efforts in transforming the economic and industrial systems of the developed countries are sustained. This cautionary indication reinforces the need to urgently reverse the obvious gross injustice. Although Africa has 40% of the world's renewable energy resources, the continent only received 2% of the 3 trillion renewable energy investments made over the past decade. That is the injustice I'm talking about. The trend is consistent across the global south, given that we host the three basins of biodiversity, biodiversity ecosystems and tropical forests. It is important for us to join hands and build a global financial system and work together to reform the international financial architecture we need new financing that is going to make the World Bank, the IMF, to give us concessional financing so that we don't have to pay four or five times more than others, a fair financial architecture that treats Africa like all other continents is not too much for us to ask. And therefore, it is very important that we work uh, together in that space. And let me finalize by saying that includes the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, which makes it possible for us in this continent to trade in our local currencies without having to look for this currency or that currency.
let me ask you, good people, what Afriexin Bank is doing to promote trade in our continent is something all of us leaders must support. I am saying this with a lot of passion because we have an opportunity of a lifetime to change the fortunes of our continent, of our people, and especially of our young people using this challenge we have, which we must turn into an opportunity. As part of building the network that will ensure that we facilitate movement of people, goods and services within our continent. Kenya is going to open an embassy here in Congo Brazzaville this year. It's going to open an embassy in Cote d'Ivoire. We are opening an embassy in Rabat in Morocco. We are opening an embassy in Eritrea because it is time we realize the importance of trading among ourselves and allowing goods, services, people, ideas to move freely within our continent. And because of climate change, Africa this time round is not just a victim. In fact, Africa is not part of the problem. In fact, Africa is part of the solution. We are part of the solution because, number one, we have the largest 40% of all renewable energy resources globally is in our continent. We have 30% of all minerals resources globally, including the ones that are necessary and critical for the transition, for energy transition. Number three, we have 60% of the world's arable, uncultivated land with, which, with smart agriculture, we can feed not just ourselves, but we can feed the globe. Number four, 25% of the world's population will be living here. We have the youngest population at the median age of 19. 40% of the world's workforce will be from this continent by 2100. And let me say this, we have the natural resources, including the carbon sinks, and therefore we are the continent that's going to provide the solution for climate change and the existential threats that the world faces. But it will not, we will not make progress unless we act in concert, unless we work together, unless we build the Africa Union as a fit for purpose vehicle to carry the aspirations of all our young people in this continent and everybody in this continent. We have visa regulations left, right, and center. 27 countries in Europe today with 430 million people removed visas. We still have visas. Let me persuade us that it is time we in this continent realize that having visa restrictions amongst ourselves is working against us when people cannot travel when people cannot travel business people cannot travel entrepreneurs cannot travel we all become net losers. I am very happy that we are now moving in the direction of eliminating visas amongst ourselves. Let me say this. As Kenya, by the end of this year, no African will be required to have a visa to come to Kenya.
And and I am very proud that the intra-trade within the East African community is already at 27 percent because we have taken the deliberate decision to remove unnecessary tariffs and visa regulations. I am also very happy that my father here, President Sassung Gweso, when he came to Kenya, we agreed that there will be no visa requirement between the Democrats. Between, between Kenya and the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, Brazzaville. I am also happy, I am also happy that last month, when we removed visa requirements for DRC, my brother, President Felix, Chisekedi also removed visa requirements for Kenyans to DRC. Let me urge us that we need greater collaboration. Our children from this continent should not be locked in borders in Europe and also be locked in borders in Africa. Our rulers partitioned our continent about 100 years ago. And they taught us two things using the borders. They told us, they taught us about tariffs and they taught us about visas. Now, Whether you are talking about the British in Kenya, the French, Belgians, Portuguese, today all of them are members of the European Union. 27 countries. They don't have tariffs. They don't have tariffs among themselves and they don't have visas. The only people left with tariffs and visas is us. And because they saw the folly of tariffs on trade and removed tariffs on trade among themselves, today in Europe, Intra-European trade is at 70%, while intra-Africa trade is at 15%. Good people, it is the reason why we must accelerate the Africa continental free trade area. And, and unlock the potential that exists for African countries to trade amongst themselves. <laughs> Working together is no longer an option. It is a necessary imperative. I agree with my brother that the choice is, are we going to float together or are we going to sink? So collaboration, working together, is no longer an option. The forests of the Global South, including the three basins, support the lives and livelihoods of indigenous people sustainably by providing timber and timber products, food and medicines, as well as ecosystem services, such as air purification, carbon removal, pollination, ecotourism, 
and culture as well as ritual assets. Without meaningful investment in incentives to support the maintenance of this sustainable coexistence, communities embark on a zero-sum struggle for survival and economic subsistence which can lead to irreparable harm to biodiversity through deforestation, destruction of habitats and ecosystems, and illegal wildlife trade. At the level of human survival, critical ecological considerations are relegated to wishful luxuries, and our planet and all life on it become net losers. We who are gathered here today understand very well that to the extent that human survival is personal, climate action measures, as well as the protection of biodiversity, ecosystems, and forests is equally personal to our indigenous communities. What we do with these truths, therefore, matters a great deal. A good starting point is to appreciate that a more responsive international financial architecture would do a lot in financing necessary incentives to mobilize different stakeholders, including indigenous communities, to align their economic strategies with climate action and the protection of biodiversity. The Africa Union's Committee of African Heads of State on Climate Change recognizes this position. This is why we find much alignment between the agenda of the summit and the Africa Climate Summit, which I was privileged to host early last month in Nairobi. We know the direction we must take going forward and the choices that must be, must be made have never been clearer. We have a momentous opportunity to galvanize effective South-to-South -South collaboration on a critical global agenda given that the fundamental objectives of this summit broadly align with the outcome of the African leaders' Nairobi Declaration on Climate and call to action. It is possible for us to develop a clear, strong, united position to project our collective agenda at COP28. Articles of the Declaration recognize that Africa's vast forests especially the Congo Basin rainforest, are the largest carbon sinks globally and a critical ecosystem for that. Nevertheless, Africa's natural capital has not been properly valued. Consequently, the Africa Climate Summit Declaration calls for re-evaluation and revaluation of the gross domestic product of Africa by incorporating a proper computation of its abundant natural capital and ecosystem services from its vast forests that sequester carbon so as to unlock new sources of wealth for our continent. The Declaration further emphasizes that the valuation framework should entail the use of natural resource accounting in the development of national accounting standards. African leaders, therefore, committed to strengthen actions to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, prevent deforestation, combat desertification, and restore degraded lands landscapes. This is expected to achieve land degradation neutrality, implement a global biodiversity framework, and enhance the integrity and efficacy of carbon markets. More encouragingly, there are signs that a new global coalition to transform multilateral climate action is not only feasible, it is actually an imminently practical proposition at this point.